to do again, okay? But I'm glad you're here and want to welcome all of you uh, to Cross Point today. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. And I uh, want to um, welcome all those that are watching online. We're glad that you're worshiping with us, traveling. Uh, we were on vacation. We tuned in uh, uh, online, and so it's just nice little uh, something to have. And so I want to welcome all of you that are watching online as well. Um, you're a guest with us this morning. We're honored you're here. I know I met at least a person. Uh, there's a connection cards in the chair in front of you. Pull those out, and uh, you can just fill that connection card out, and you can drop it in the offering, or there's a connection card box at the Welcome Center. You can drop it there as you're exiting this morning. We're honored you're here. Pray the Lord will speak to your heart and life, and if there's anything we can do for you or minister to you, uh, we would just love to do so. Um, if we have this morning a faith story, and um, John and Marie Smith, why don't you come? They're going to come, and they've been with us just a short time, but I've known of them for quite some time. They love the Lord, and, uh, and some things that are coming up, I asked them to come and just share what God did in their life, kind of a turnaround in their lives, and so would you welcome John and Marie uh, Smith with us? Good morning. Hello. Um, just wanted to give a little bit quick <clears throat> testimony of how we got saved and came to the Lord. Um, so I grew up in a mainstream denomination, um, went to church every Sunday, went to a private school up to eighth grade, um, a, a, a normal a normal childhood, normal family life. Um, I'm the youngest of six children. So um, I would say a about sixth or seventh grade, um, one of my friends, um, a school friend, asked me if I wanted to kind of indulge in some wine, some alcohol. Um, and I said, sure, why not? You know, I was a little bit of a rebellious teenager. So um, got, me, got us some wine. We drank. We got drunk. I thought, hey, this is fun. So that led to more drinking. Um, smoking cigarettes, and uh, just that kind of a lifestyle. So um, at a very young age, I, I was kind of hooked into that alcohol scene. So um, I took that all the way through high school, um, partied every weekend, um, started to indulge in marijuana and uh, more smoking cigarettes. I mean, every weekend was pretty much, let's get drunk. So. Needless to say, I wasn't the best student in the world. So, um, at our and in my senior year, I met John in the middle of our senior year, and and he as well was a drinker. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have went out with him. So, um, so we partied together, and he had friends that partied, and I had friends that partied. So we all connected together, and uh, um, that was our lifestyle, and uh, that's what we look forward to. So. Uh, we got married, um, carried on that whole drinking tradition through our married life, met other friends that drank. Of course, we live in Wisconsin. How can you not find other people that drank? So, I mean, our life was just pretty much um, work Monday through Friday, party on the weekends, and party hard, you know. So we did that. We did that. And then pretty soon that wasn't even enough. So we started drinking during the week. So we started going to the bars during the week, you know. And... Um, we did that for about four or five years, I would say, and um, we both, both at the same time, just kind of like, uh, we were at our friend's house, and of course we were drinking, and um, we just both kind of said, there's got to be more to life than this. Is this all there is? I mean, there's got to be more. There was an emptiness in our heart. We didn't know what it was, but um, a deep emptiness. So we thought, well, it's education. We never went to college, so that must be it. We must need to go to school and get an education and make money and be rich. That, that had to be it. So we started looking at different schools and um, kind of thinking about what we want to do with our life. And then John's uncle introduced us to Amway. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Amway. Maybe, yes. I see some heads shaking. So it's, it's kind if you're not familiar with it, it's... Um, and a network marketing business where you get other people underneath you and then you make money off of them. So anyway, we thought, well, this is it. We have arrived. This is our answer. This is, we don't have to go to school. We'll just join Amway and we'll get rich. And um, so, 
So we joined Amway, and we met this couple through Amway. Um, they were our age. They didn't have any kids. We didn't have any kids. So we spent a lot of time with them, not only <clears throat> during our Amway meetings, but you know, on the weekends as well. And they were a really great couple. We had a lot of fun together. So um, we would go to these conventions when, when you belong to Amway. Um, they have conventions, four or five of them a year across the country. So we'd travel with them. We rode down to these conventions with them. We stayed at hotels with them. And we were just really great friends. So at these conventions, you go, you get there. Um, it's Friday, Saturday. And they start early in the morning and they end late at night. So, you know, you're kind of exhausted. And so on Sunday morning, they would also offer a non denation non-denominational non service. So they would offer that whoever wanted to come. And it was rather early because they knew people had to check out, pack, and, and drive back to their homes. So um, our friends would ask us every time, hey, come on, get up. Let's, do you want to come to church with us? And we'd be like, no, we want to sleep. <laughs> and they'd be like, okay. So they would go to church, and they'd come back. We'd pack up, and just they never said anything else. And uh, the, the second time again, hey, you guys want to come, come to church with us? And we're like, no, we're tired. We want to sleep. We don't want to go to church. And they're like, okay, fine. So they'd go to church, same thing. This went on four or five times. Finally, we were getting kind of like, gosh, they just keep bugging us to go to church. Let's just go so we can shut them up. We can say we didn't like it, and then that'll be the end of it. Mm -hmm. So, sure, we did go, okay, we'll go to church. So we went to the church. Um, it was just, I don't know, three, 500 people. I don't even know. But there was no pastor or anything like that. It was just one of the leaders of Amway preached the gospel. And um, so he started talking about um, the blood of Jesus and how he sacrificed his life and his shed blood for our sins. Well, as I said, I grew up in a church. I heard this thousands of times. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But God opened my eyes at that time for the very first time to understand what he did and that I can come to him just as I am. So before that, I didn't feel worthy of coming to him. I thought, man, i got to clean up my life. I drink, I smoke, I swear, I lie, I do all this stuff. God doesn't want me like this. i got to clean up my life before I ever, you know, try to serve the Lord. So, um but he explained to me that he wants us to come as we are. And my eyes were opened for the first time, and the Holy Spirit just opened my heart, and I understood what that sacrificial lamb really meant and what he did for us and that how much he loved us. So um, they had an altar call, and I was, boom, up there. <laughs> I did not waste any time. And... Uh, the Spirit of God was just upon me like nothing ever before, and I just felt, just like the song said, the burden was lifted, the heaviness was lifted. I felt like a brand new person. I was literally born again. So um, that's how I came to know the Lord. We went back to town with our friends. Of course, we were talking about Jesus the whole way home, eight-hour drive, and uh, they invited us to church, and we finally found a church, because they lived in Algoma, so we finally found a church in Green Bay. But, um, yeah, that's... My story. So, <laughs> your turn. <clears throat> well, I I grew up in the same um, denomination, and we were like twice a year, three times a year, we go to church, and it wasn't a. <clears throat> um, I didn't have a relationship with God, and you know, when I was young, I would just say to, you know, I'd say the prayer beside my bed before I went to sleep, and then I would also, if I lost something, I would pray for that to be found, and I would also pray if I needed something, you know, so that's, that was my um, relationship with God, that's, that's how I thought you were supposed to react, and well, as we got married, you know, like Marie told you about the partying and stuff, and you know, it was a, it was a good lifestyle, we liked it, we, we didn't want to um, get out of it, really, so um, after a while, when we did make that decision to go and, um, you know, she went up to the altar call and I was like, I'm glad for her. <laughs> you know, she needed it. She really did. 
But I didn't have that pulling of my heart. God, you know, for some reason, I um, didn't go up. So, you know, it was, um, I was very happy, though, very happy. And, you know, later on, um, this is probably within a week or so, um, I was just about to come up to bed, and I turned off the TV, and God just spoke to me. Yes, and it was um, pretty powerful, and I just knelt down alongside the, the couch and gave my heart to him. Just said, Lord, you know, I'm yours. And, you know, the conversion was instant, and he went from becoming my, he was my genie and became my savior just in a split second. So, you know, that was a, you know, big deal in our lives. And I remember um, distinctly, you know, I swore a lot. I was in, I'm in construction. I mean, come on, we were on the job site and everybody, I mean, it's every other sentence, you know. Um, so that was a part, you know, of the construction life and stuff. And God took that away from me. I mean, not 100%, but like 95% of that was just gone. Just a miracle. And then the drinking, it took a while to subside. And then um, we actually, um, soon after we were um, um, saved, we, we took, I, I took the booze bottles and I just dumped it right down the sink. Got rid of my, my music, gave that away. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. So the conversion was happening. We were really um, touched in God. God really took us from, like I said, we were going towards that grave that they were singing about. We were going there really, really, really quick. And he, he helped, he, he just turned us around. So it was, it was wonderful. We had um, uh, a good support system. We joined a local church and um, the pastor and his wife really helped us and mentored us, got us into some discipleship classes and helped us in our marriage and with our children. And, um, you know, just all of that changed for us. And we are so grateful and just praise God every day. So very thankful. John and Marie, you're going to hear a little bit more about that in a, a little bit later in the service. But uh, uh, love you guys and glad you're part of our congregation. Um, if you, uh, do we got our sound problems straightened out here? I apologize for our sound. Do you guys hear okay out there? Can you hear okay? Okay. Sorry about the little issues we've had. Um, ushers, why don't you come forward and prepare, uh, and I want to invite the rest of you to prepare your morning tithes and offerings. And thank you for your faithfulness in giving. And... Uh, <clears throat> God's helping us through the summer as we're in and out vacation. I know I've had to prepare my giving because we've been gone. So thank you for your faithfulness and giving to the Lord and uh, meeting. Uh, it's meeting every need that we have here. And uh, just while you're preparing, just let me just give a couple things. Everybody, everything, uh, everybody's invited to our fellowship outside. You can see the tent set out. Even if you didn't bring food, come join us and grab a, even if you stay for 30 minutes, just grab something to eat and uh, you can be out uh, the door and on with your day. Uh, you don't have to run up the street to McDonald's and go uh, run through the drive through okay? Just hang out and eat. It's okay. Uh, just hang with us. Um, I want to just mention about a Move to the Group uh, Kids event that's coming up a week uh, from Saturday on the 24th from 10 to 12. Um, and you'll, uh, parents, you want to sign your kids up, and we need workers. There's a sign-up out there. Uh, come. It'll be a great time from 10 to 12 on the 24th. Men's breakfast, August 7th. And then our church picnic on August 15th, come and be a part of at that. And uh, we're going to have uh, giant blow-up balloons and a bigger tent and all that kind of good stuff outside. Be a part of that. Uh, Nate Blazeski, lead us to Lord in Prayer for the offerings. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today and to worship you. And Lord, we just pray that you would take every gift, every, every offering that's given, and just multiply it to meet the needs of the church and that we would be able to bless more than we have been. Uh, bless locally as well as abroad. And Lord, we just we pray you would bless your people and uh, just give us a wonderful time of fellowship after the service. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you as you give.
Okay, we're in a series in the book of Acts. Uh, if you want to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 8, and we've uh, titled this series, Not Alone. Uh, how many of you are glad we're not alone? The Holy Spirit is with us. How many are glad about that? Yeah. I want to just uh, bring to you a message that I've entitled this morning in this uh, message series, um, a message entitled, The Turnaround. Uh, the Turnaround. And so we'll be looking, I'm not going to read in advance, I'm going to be reading several scriptures throughout Acts 8, as that is our focus this morning. And um, uh, I want to just begin with this, just this thought. All of us in the room, at times of our life, we need a turnaround at some point. And I was reading uh, several years ago in the Green Bay Press Gazette about the owner of Broadway Ford. I, I, I can't remember his name. I think it was uh, Frank Keene who owned it. And uh, he had retired or sold out to Van Boxels or something like that. And uh, they were telling his story that... Uh, he reached a point that business was so bad at one point that he had $100 left to his name. And um, that situation turned, it turned around, and by the time that he retired and finished, that he was going around giving employees out $100, just walking through and giving various employees $100. And so they experienced a turnaround. And so maybe you're here this morning, um, and in your life situation, maybe there's in your family relationships, there's been hurtful uh, family relationships. God wants to turn that around to be uh, uh, healthy family relationships. Maybe you're in this room, you've, you struggle with friendships or not having enough friends. I want to tell you, God can turn that around and giving you more, fr- give you more friends than, than you could have ever dreamed. Uh, there's maybe some of you that have a struggling marriage. He can take that and he can make that into a, a happy marriage. No matter what your situation, I want you to know how many of you are glad we serve a God to turn around. He, that's the kind of God that he is in our lives. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today. I pray as we talk about and, and speak from this passage of scripture, I pray that you speak to every person's heart and life. I pray that no matter what their situation is, I pray that you would encourage them and you would help them today. In your name we pray. Amen. I want you to know in your Bibles, um, we encourage you to bring your Bibles every week and because uh, that's what we study out of. It's good to mark up your own Bibles. But somebody donated the Bibles that are in the chairs in front of you in the racks, and they came and they uh, donated some money, and so we got those, and those are there, and uh, they're a blessing. Now, here's the deal with those Bibles. Uh, they're from, I'm, I preach the New King James Version. I think Chad does too. And um, uh, in, with them, if you don't have a Bible... Uh, and you need a Bible, you take it. It's yours, okay? If you have your Bible and you're just using it for the Sunday, you can just slip it back there. And, uh, but if you don't have a Bible, it's our gift to you today. Okay, let's uh, talk about this a little bit more. There's, there's times that we come and we're broken, we're bruised, we're beaten down, or beaten up. But I want you to know it's the heart of God to turn those situations, those life circumstances around in our life. And so at the end of my message, I'm going to give a few practical things. If you're dealing with a a, a situation where you need turnaround in your life, I'm going to give you just some practical things to to focus on. Uh, But here's what we got to do as we get delve into the scripture here. In your head, I got to deal with one issue. You say, well, pastor, it can turn around for everybody else out there, but not me. I want you to know that don't do that. Uh, he, he's the kind of God that he can, he's going to show up to the least likely. You might see yourself as the least likely, but he wants to come and touch your life, even if you seem like the least likely. God can do it for you. Um, here is another thing in our head that can get sometimes. Um, God couldn't do it for them. He couldn't turn their life around. Do you know how bad their life is out there? I want you to know that God can turn anybody's life around. So as we look at this this morning, the first point I want to talk about is he can turn around the least likely, the least likely. Acts 8 is a study of the least likely that God begins to turn around their life. And so I want to start with the, 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 the scriptural precedent for this idea of turnaround. So I'm going to look at four either individuals or a group, one group in here. The first one is Saul. Look, uh, actually back up to chapter 7 a moment in verse 58. Uh, as Pastor Chris so effectively uh, spoke last Sunday. Thank, thank you, Pastor Chris. 
And verse 58, it says, Stephen was killed. He was murdered in Acts chapter 7. Verse 58, it says this, and they cast Stephen's clothes. uh, They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, a young man named Saul. Here is the attitude of Saul. Look at this. It says in verse 1, now Saul uh, of chapter 8, now Saul was consenting to his death. That's Stephen's death. At the time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now look at verse 3. It says, as Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Doesn't this seem like a guy who's the least likely to have their life turned around? That was his nature. He was creating havoc for Christians. He was creating havoc for believers. Um, he was an accident waiting to happen. You might look at some of your friends or, and, 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 or relatives, family members, and they're the most mocking towards Christianity. They're towards the m- most mocking towards you, maybe towards other believers. And you say they will never turn their life to, to, around to Jesus Christ. Never happen to, to what happened to John and Marie. It'll never happen in, in, in their life. Guess what? We see what happened to Saul. God got a hold of his life and turned his life around. Now, we don't see in this chapter the complete turnaround. That's going to be next Sunday's message. It shows his complete turnaround in in chapters 9 through 11. But God takes him from this havoc creator and turns his life completely around. Um. Uh, then the next is here in uh, the Samaritans in verse 5. So Saul is verses 1 through 3. The Samaritans are verse 5. Look at this. It says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. So let's just talk about the Samaritans for a moment. They were non-Jews. There was an area just north of, uh, of Judea called Samaria. And then north of that was Galilee the northern region of Israel. But the Samaritans, in order to go from the south to the north, you had to go uh, through Samaria. And, but the Jews did not look at them. They did not talk to the Samaritans. They were people that were looked down on. They were, not, uh, they were not loved. They were not treated right. They were not treated with respect. And um, so it was that territory um, so now, now Jesus used the Samaritans, uh, and he, he reached them and loved them. But do you remember when the Jews were kind of self-righteous? And Jesus comes along in Luke 10, and he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. He, he's kind of, it, it's in the face of the Jews who thought that they were so good and they're self-righteous. And Jesus says to them, he tells the whole parable, uh, the parable and it was not, not a parable, a true story about the Good Samaritan who... Um, helped the gentleman that was on the side of the road. And he said to them, look at this good Samaritan. He's done more than you. And he extolled the Samaritan in the face of the Jews. And uh, so how about Jesus and the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4? Here she'd been married five times. Her life was an absolute mess. Jesus comes and talks to her when nobody else wanted to talk to her. Jesus met her at that well, and her life was changed at the moment at that well because Jesus took time for her. Uh, She was of this group of the Samaritans. In Acts 1.8, he says, You shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you shall be witnesses, what? In Jerusalem and in Judea and where? Samaria, and then to the rest of the world. He included the Samarians. They were a look-down-on group of people. And here in Acts chapter 8, a large portion of chapter 8 is the reach-out to this group of people. You would call them the least likely that he begins to touch their lives. Now, their lives were so touched. Look at what it says in verse 6. It's or verse eight, excuse me. It says that their lives were touched. They were healed. They were delivered from unclean spirits. In verse eight, it says there was great joy in the city because so many of the Samaritans lives were turned around. God did an incredible work in their lives. It says that Samaria, there was great joy in the city, even though they appeared to be the least likely God touched their life. In chapter 8 here, there is another least likely. How many would think somebody like a witch or somebody into witchcraft would be a least likely? We see the story of the sorcerer here in chapter 8, verses 9 through 24. Um, 
I, I don't know if uh, this man's name was Simon the Sorcerer. Have you ever got around those kinds of people and you get around them and the hair is just like standing on the back of your neck? You go, mm, ah, something's weird about that person. I, I, I like the TV show Alone. And I, anybody else like the TV show Alone? Anybody watch it? I'm the only one in this room. Uh, it's a, yeah, you're afraid to sh- raise your hands, right? Um, and it's, a, it's on the History Channel, and it's every Thursday night at 8.30, and it's this crazy, they put this survivalist out, and they just, they have like 10 items, and they have to live in the woods, and they have to survive. And, and whoever survives the longest, um, they get a, ha- a half million dollars. $500,000, that's a half million, right? And um, so... I, 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 I'm intrigued, but there's this one guy in, this, in the series this year, and uh, he, he gets on, introduces himself. He goes, I'm into pagan worship. And I go, oh, Lord, not, not that. But anyway, you get around. This, so this was this kind of guy. This, he, was, he was the least likely the sorcerer who's, who's here. It says, look at verses 9 through 11. Look in your Bibles. It says, but there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city, and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. We look at the outset. You might look at some people you know, and you say, They're the least likely to come to the Lord. That's who this man was. But here, here's how the, he got all these people, they start getting all, all these people, their lives are touched, they're delivered from unclean spirits, they're being healed, they're being delivered. And uh, uh, so Simon, the sorcerer, is watching everything that's going on. He's watching in amazement all these people's lives are being changed. In verse 12, it says this, And when they believed Philip as uh, he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And look what happened to him, verse 13. It says, Then Simon himself also believed when he was bab- and he was baptized and continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles, signs, and wonders that were done. So even the sorcerer here... He believed in Jesus Christ. His life was turned around. He couldn't believe the things that he saw. It's like uh, Maria and John, you going into that meeting and all this, what is going on here? And you weren't ready. You weren't uh, suspecting it. And neither was Simon the sorcerer. And his life was turned around. Last in chapter 8 here, we see under this point, we see the successful, or you want to call it the sophisticated, in verses 26 through 38. Sometimes we can look at people and we say, well, their life is successful, they don't need God, or they're sophisticated, they want to be intellectual, and they don't need God. I, had, I was pastoring in Minnesota, and uh, one day I saw this couple that was walking by the church, and they walked by three or four times a week, and I would see them. And, and, um, and you know, we, 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 I, I'm guilty of it too, okay, probably just like you are. And we, we say, ah, I don't know if that person will ever come to church. I don't know if that person will ever turn to the Lord. And, and I, I just said to myself this stupid little comment, I don't know if those people will ever come to church. I mean, why, why would I say something like that? I mean, we just say stuff like that. I mean, we, now, you're looking at me. You think it, okay, right? Um, but lo and behold, I started praying for them. And guess what? Before, before long, they're walking in the doors to church, and they're a part of our congregation, and they'd been living down the street, uh, they'd been living together, and, and had two or three kids, and they finally came up and said, would you marry us? And, and I married them, and we just had, they're just, with Scott and Denise, just wonderful people, but for me, looking at them like the least likely, God had prepared. Now, I wanted to say that, you, you know, if people are successful, like we're going to look at this story of this Ethiopian here. Uh, eunuch. And um, can I just tell you that no matter if people are successful, they still need Jesus. They still need friends. Sometimes they're lonely. They don't know who to talk to. You know what? Treat, treat people the same. No matter if they've got rags on or, or they've got successful clothes on, no matter what. Someone, you know what? Look at people as people. I know we've got a bunch of this racism stuff going on now and all that stuff. You know, can I just tell you, as soon as somebody says something about racism, can I tell you what? They're the racist. That's the truth. 
Well, why are we looking at somebody's skin anyway? It doesn't matter. We're not looking. We're, we look at the people's hearts, right? We look at who people are and their character, their nature, who they are. We don't look at any of that other stuff. It doesn't matter what you have on, what you're wearing. It doesn't make any difference. So don't have any bias, no matter how, what, if, if it's somebody's poor or somebody's rich. Treat people the same. Let the love of Jesus come through. And so here, we see here uh, in verse... Uh, Look in your Bibles here about this man, verse 27. It says, so he arose and he went, and this is Philip talking, and, and, or Philip meeting him, and he says, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all the treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. That's pretty amazing. Here's this successful, sophisticated person had come to Jerusalem for the purpose of worshiping. And they were seeking, they were hungry for the Lord. And no matter of their, their success and their sophistication, that was a hunger. Now look at this down a little bit uh, further. Look at down to verse um, 30. So, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said to him, so this man is riding from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia, and he's riding in a chariot, uh, probably a government type of, of vehicle at that time, and important individual, but what's he doing? He's reading the Bible. He's reading God's word. There was a hunger, desire to worship the Lord. And I want to tell you, no matter what walk of life we come from, there's hunger and there's desire that can be in us no matter what our background and so, so, so Philip ran to him, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and said to him, do you understand what you're reading? He, I could see Philip running, trying to catch this chariot. He said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can, I un, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him and explain what he was reading. What a beautiful, what a beautiful passage of this person. He had a hunger for God's word. So I just want to leave you with a truth here out of this point and I want to move on and finish my last couple points this morning. So th it's this. Jesus can turn around the person you think least likely. Jesus can turn around the person you think least likely. Don't write anybody off. He can reach anybody's heart, anybody's life, and he can do it. And we see these examples that we've looked at. Number two this morning in our text, the Holy Spirit falls on the least likely. So we see in verse 14 that um, Peter and John get called from Jerusalem. Uh, they see that, uh, that many in Samaria are receiving God's word. Their lives are being touched. And they come to Samaria. And it says in verse 15 that uh, when they had come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Um, and then in verse 16, uh, Luke, the writer of this, he makes the distinction that, and, and I'll read verse 16, it says, for as yet, he, uh, as yet he had fallen upon none of them, that's the Holy Spirit, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they'd been baptized in water, but they'd been not ba baptized in the Holy Spirit. So they were baptized in water as young people or as an adults. So this is not something done younger. This was something there to receive the Holy Spirit at a later point in life. And they wanted to make that clarification as they came into Samaria that this was something after even water baptism. Not that that has to be done in that order, but um, for this text it is. So here we see the Samaritans, again, the least likely that the Holy Spirit comes on, and it says in verse 17, it says they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon the Samaritans, and uh, so the, Ho the Holy Spirit's poured on the disciples and the Jews and the 120 at the upper room. The Holy Spirit uh, poured out on the Samaritans here, the least likely group in chapter 8, and later the Gentiles in chapter 10 and 11. And so the Holy Spirit comes at the laying on of hands and here. So, and there's some of you that you want to receive the Holy Spirit in a fresh way. And we're going to have a service in August that, that we're going to just lay hands on people. You want to receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, as an adult, as somebody older, we're going to pray for you that you'll receive uh, the Holy Spirit. So, uh, and we'll lay hands on you. Number three, God uses the least likely to assist others in, a turn, in their turnaround. So God uses the least likely to assist others in their turnaround. 
So Philip is the character here that we see that God is using in this passage of Scripture. So Philip is being used, but here's something you got to know about Philip. Philip is not a, the disciple Philip. Philip is a non-apostle, but God used him mighty, mightily. Now, so there was a Philip that was a, one of the disciples. This Philip is only mentioned one other time in Acts 21, and they went to his house, and in the Scripture in Acts 21 says he had four daughters that prophesied. Um, but so Acts 8 is the only place that Philip uh, is used here or seen even in the Bible. So I want you to know that God can use you. You say, I'm the least likely that God can use. I want you to know that God can use you to touch another person's life, to see their life turned around. Maybe it's a, a word of hope that you give them. Maybe it's sharing Jesus. It's, it's whatever. John and Marie, when they shared their stories, it was their friends that said, hey, come to church. And he, God used them and to just they're regular people that God used to assist in the turning around. So God used this person, uh, Philip. Now, there's something to note here in this, of God's using a Philip. He had a special place in his heart for those that were of different races or nationalities. We saw that he reached out to the Samaritans who were at that time considered another race. God used him here to touch the Ethiopians. You almost want to say he's a missionary. But he, God used him here to reach people with different backgrounds, different racial backgrounds, and God used him. And so we see here that one of the things that Philip, God, way that God used him was to explain the Scripture. And we read that a moment ago. It says, the, the Ethiopian eunuch, he said in verse 31, how can I understand the Scripture unless someone guides me? Can I tell you what? <clears throat> you, God's given you his word, and and. God can use you to explain the scriptures to your friends and family members. Do you know that? It doesn't take me. Sometimes it comes better from somebody like you just explaining what happened to you, just allowing the scriptures to come into your heart and life, and, and you just relating them in a way that the scripture spoke to you. It does not need a sermon. It doesn't need some teaching at church. God's given you the scripture so God can use you. Now, I want to mention in relating to this, one of the things that we needed to improve on, and, and Chad had mentioned it to me, that uh, when somebody comes and gives their life to Christ, that we didn't have a real good discipleship model. It's kind of come to church or get involved in one of our other Bible studies or women's Bible study or men's Bible study. But we didn't have a, something, a discipleship set up right after somebody commits their life to Christ. And so we've changed that. And one of the reasons I had John and Marie up here uh, earlier today is um, that they're going to lead a Vision for Life Beginner's Bible Study. It's right here, and they're going to lead that. Um, and there's a sign-up out at the uh, Welcome Center that you can sign up for this. You say, Pastor, I don't know my Bible. Maybe you've been serving the Lord a little while, and you just don't know your Bible very well. They will help you. Um, if you. If people come to the Lord and they're just new to Christ, um, we can get them right into this, uh, and they can study this. They'll see John and Marie. So if you're here this morning want to be a part of this, you can just go talk to John and Marie afterwards or out at the picnic and say, I want to be a part of this. Diego gave his life to the Lord just recently. Diego, that class is for you. Okay, pal? And uh, uh, so uh, I want to encourage you to be a part of that. See them, and it's just beginning, understanding God's word, and they'll walk you through the beginning steps of Bible study and uh, be a part of that. So that's just what Philip did here with the Ethiopian. Now, one other thing that I want to mention here is that Philip talked to, to him, and they had this conversation about baptism. You'll notice in Acts chapter 8, every time that either the Samaritans, they received Jesus, they were baptized. Whether it was Simon the sorcerer, what happened? He got baptized. Here, the same conversation, he opens his heart, the Ethiopian unit believes, and look, pick it up in verse um, uh, 36. Uh, verse 35, it says, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at the Scripture, he preached Jesus to him from this passage of Isaiah. He sh shares with Jesus, verse 36, it says, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then now that's pretty quick. He just believes, and he says, hey, here's some water. Can I, can I be baptized right now? And so verse 37, then Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. 
And he answered and says, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You know what? All it takes to, to, be, a, uh, to be a candidate, to be baptized in water, it's, it's right there is the answer. Believe in Jesus Christ with all of your heart. It doesn't matter your church attendance. It doesn't matter your church name. It doesn't matter any of that stuff. It just, do you believe in Jesus with all of your heart? You're a candidate uh, to receive Jesus. Um. So it says in verse 38, as he commanded the chariot to stand still, both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. So look at what happened here. They went down into the water. Now, uh, let me just say that people are baptized different ways, sprinkling, pouring, all that stuff. Th this is not to criticize the way anybody else chooses to be baptized, okay? Uh, and it's even some of the mainline denominations, they just went to sprinkling and pouring, not out of a difference of intent of heart. They did it just out of convenience. They don't have a tank of water or don't have a go to a lake or something like that. So we're not here to criticize anyway. But he, to point out that this method by which this Ethiopian was baptized was by immersion. They go down into the water, it says, um, in verse 38. The eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. It says, now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. And so they went down into the water, and they came up out of the water, and they were baptized. So I want to challenge all of you in this room. We're going to have a water baptismal service in correlation with our picnic on August 15th. If you have not followed the Lord in the waters of baptism, August 15th is your date. I want to encourage you to do what the Ethiopian did. You may be newer to our church. That doesn't matter. Uh, we, we, want you to, we want you to follow the Lord in the waters of baptism. And, and you don't even have to come to our church to be a part of uh, that baptism. We want to baptize you. It'd be an honor to. Baptism represents new life, a fresh start, cleansing, turning from death to life, just like we sang about in that beautiful song. Uh, and it, it's, it's a fresh beginning. It's a mark of a turnaround in a life. And uh, I'd be honored to baptize you, but I am just encourage you, all of you in this room, and I and, and that's you got to put the excuses away. I'm I'm afraid of water. I don't I, you know I don't want my hair to get wet. Just put all those crazy stuff aside, okay? And say I want to be baptized, and because to mark that I am a full follower of Jesus Christ. And so we will do it on that day. We've always, every year we do it on our, our picnic Sunday, and we're going to have a great baptism. So if you want to be baptized, you can sign up at the Welcome Center and be a part of this. So as uh, we review and we think about this this morning, uh, I want us just to uh, think about these things that God reaches. He can turn around the least likely. Um, he can, uh, his, the Holy Spirit falls on the least likely, and he uses the least likely in assisting others. Now, I just, I said at the beginning, I'm, I was going to mention just, if you're going through something and you need to turn on, I, want, I just want to mention some things, and I'm just two minutes and I'm done. Some of you are perhaps going through some of the strangest, challenging, most challenging things in your life right now. Number one, let me just tell you this. No matter what you're dealing with, live your life by God's plan. Don't divert from that. Some of you are going through something, and it's going to lead you into God's plan. John and Marie were telling the story of their life. They were just getting drunk, and it was, it was, the drinking was getting out of hand. It was out of control. God doesn't want that stuff to consume us. It's not going to necessarily send somebody to hell, but don't let that consume your life. Don't let that destroy your life. Live your life by God's plan and, and God's character. It don't matter what every, all your friends are doing. Sometimes some of you might have to walk away with, from what your other friends are doing and say, I'm going to live my life according to God's plan. Live your life by God's plan. Secondly, you have a lot of options. You're not stuck. Um, God has for you, maybe it's new travel, new hobbies, new opportunities. There's things that maybe sometimes in life we can just get stuck in routines and ruts that we need to break out of those. As long as they're godly desires, they're good desires, right? And, uh, and we can go in good paths, and we, we have a lot of options. Maybe, you're, maybe you're, you feel stuck in your job, and, and maybe you need to say, God, I need to get a new perspective in my job, or maybe God can give you a new job, or whatever the case might be. You're not stuck. You have a lot of options. And I want to tell you, there's great hope. We have, hope is the anticipation of good things. Can I tell you what? God has given us all great hope in him. Now, I want to say this that some of you are maybe going through something that's difficult and challenging because of this. 
that I've found, I've learned, pastoring many years in personal experience, sometimes we go through things, God is making you stronger. Sometimes we have to muscle through some things. Sometimes we have to get through some tough spots where there needs to be a turnaround. And it's because God, he works through weakness. When everything is going perfect in our life, what happens? Pride enters our life. We get arrogant. We get cocky. But when things are tough is when change comes in our life. And, and we open up our heart, and what God does is in those weak parts, we become strong. Let God make you strong in those weak points that you're dealing with. I also want you to know that God heals the brokenhearted. You're in this room, you're brokenhearted over some situation. Maybe it's kids, marriage, it's, it's work, it's life, it's circumstances, whatever it is. I want you to know that we serve a Savior, Jesus, who heals the broken heart. You're carrying pain in your so- in sorrow, depression, or heartache in your heart. I want you to know he can take that and he can lift that from your life and give you new perspective going forward. He, that's, he specializes in that. And last is this, in just a practical sense. Help others while you're healing. You still got pain in your heart. You still got rough stuff going on in your heart and your life. Whatever the turnaround needs to happen, you begin to help others. You begin to serve others, and God will bring healing to you because what you sow into other people's lives, you're going to reap. And God will use that uh, in your life tremendously. Let's stand together this morning. There's perhaps one or two of you in this room that from the very start of this service that the Lord's been speaking to your heart and life, that your life needs a turnaround. And even that song that was new to me that we began to sing, and the the, the heart of the Father is running after you. You sense this morning that God's heart in God the Father is running after you. You sense that. Um... Maybe it was John and Marie's testimony, their faith story spoke to your life. And you say, Pastor, there's some of their story that speaks into my life and resonates with me. I need Jesus. There's others who say, Pastor, I relate to one of these people. Maybe, Maybe I'm Saul. Maybe I feel like the Samaritans. Maybe I've dipped and dabbled in sorcery. Any of those scenarios, whatever they might be, but that's you. And you need to turn your life to Jesus. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. No one looking around right now. I don't know who you are or what situation, but if you need your life turned around, you need to turn to Jesus Christ right now. Just raise your hand. Say, Pastor, I need Jesus into my life right now. Just raise your right hand. Say, Pastor, pray for me in a closing prayer. I need Jesus right now. Yeah, I see a hand back over there. Is there others back up? Two, three hands right here. I see those. Praise the Lord for that. Wonderful. I need Jesus. You can put those hands down. I want to ask this last question. Maybe you're in this room right now and there's a circumstance in your family, your situation, your personal life right now. And you say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me in a closing prayer. I need a turnaround in my situation right now, whatever it is. Maybe there's just an isolated situation or maybe it's long term. Say, Pastor, pray for me in a long, I, I have some situation. I need to turn around in my life. Just raise your hand right now. Say, Pastor, I need prayer. There's several hands going up around this room. Yeah, I need a turnaround. Ah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Can we do this right now together? Let's just look at me right now. Just kind of, we put our hands out like this. I'm going to place a reception right now. And I, I first want to just pray for those who just need to receive Jesus into their heart and life. And, and then I want to just pray for all of us that just need him to touch. Just repeat, everybody repeat with these who are praying this the first time right now. Uh, Everybody repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, I come to you right now. I give you my heart. I give it in full. Forgive me of my sins. Live in my life. Be my Savior and Lord. Jesus, thank you for coming into my heart. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Father, right now you see our receptive hands open. Lord, you see, you saw hands that were across this room that, Lord, they just need to turn around. And there's maybe it's one circumstance in their life. Their life is very good, but there's a circumstance they need to turn around. 
Lord, maybe there's a situation that, Lord, that they just need your help today. God, you've seen these hands. Lord, I pray that they would just, on the precedent of this scripture, Lord, they'd receive that today. Lord, we see there's nothing impossible with Saul who was wreaking havoc, with the sorcerer, with the Samaritans. Lord, you reach the least likely. Even though many of us feel like the least likely, you're here to turn our hearts and to turn our situations. We give you the praise and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Well, um, we get to go eat something, uh, go eat a little bit. And um, so I want to just invite you, uh, even if you didn't bring something, come and join us outside just for a few minutes and eat. If you have to leave, we totally understand. Uh, no problem whatsoever. Lord bless you. Have a wonderful week. All throughout my history Your faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season From where I'm standing